Well, welcome to the Hold the Line podcast. Sean Foyt here. I am so honored and excited to have such a special guest, such a hero. Riley Riley Gaines is with us. Thank you, thank you, thank you for coming on. You are like one of the boldest voices right now in America, uh, standing up for righteousness, standing up for justice, standing up for the future of our children. So thank you for being a part of this today. Well, thank you so much for having me on. You're someone I've watched for a long time, so this is like surreal to me. So thank you. Yeah, when I'm, I really, uh, yeah, I just, I feel like there's so many different directions we could go today, but you know, I just want to thank you first and foremost, and I, I could probably speak for so many other people across America, especially Christians and believers. We're just so grateful for your your boldness, your courage, and. Uh, I love how you took a moment that that, you know, obviously was so painful, tragic, something you've worked your whole life for. And yet God is bringing such a divine redemptive purpose in your life. It's just amazing. And the platform that you have now and the voice that you have is like probably bigger than it would have ever been. Had you even have won, you know, in that obviously famous photo with you and Leah Thomas. What's that journey been like? Uh, sh- just share that with me for a minute. Like, It has been eye-opening, to say the least. Yeah. Um, I graduated from the University of Kentucky last year with my degree in human health sciences and health law. And I had every intent on this year being in dental school. Um, what I always wanted to do was actually become an endodontist, mm-hmm. which is someone who performs root canals, essentially. And that's what I thought I was going to do. That's what I was geared up and ready to do. I had scored in the top percentile on the dental admissions test, and I was ready to go. Um, I just got married after I graduated school. So I, it would have been very easy for me to essentially ride off into the sunset with the plans I had set for myself. But I right. realized this past year the quickest way to make God laugh right in your face is to make plans for yourself. Yeah. Um, he had different plans for me and when I say that I I mean really seeing the injustice that I saw firsthand witnessing Mm -hmm. it being directly impacted by it and seeing how it affected others at that same meet I realized we can no longer take this stance in really it's a lie what they're asking us to do is lie when we're doing what it is to be a um it's bigger than just the fairness in women's sports. It's all of the different pieces that go along with it in terms of the denying objective truth, in terms of the silencing that our institutions are trying to, to pressure us into, um, you know, really the submission of our voices, in terms of the changing of the language that we use. It's, it's so much bigger than just sports. And I was right. able to take a step back and kind of see that. And that's when I realized someone has to stick up for this because I had waited yeah. so long for someone else too. I waited for a coach or another swimmer or a parent or someone within the NCAA or someone with political power, someone else to do something, say something to to defend women. And I realized we weren't seeing that. And that's when I kind of um, took it upon myself to do such. Yeah. I I just, I I just love this story. I mean, God writes the best stories and, you know, similarly to you and, and, you know, we were in, in the COVID pandemic when all this happened, you know, I felt like when, when God was calling us to rise up and be like, call out the hypocrisy in the government and, you know, uh, they're closing churches, but bars and strip clubs and marijuana dispensers are open and they're essential. And it's just like, I remember thinking like, is anyone going to do anything? Like, it's kind of like, I feel like we're in this moment in America where it's like, we're, we're asking, is anyone going to do anything? And the Lord's like, uh, that's what you're here for. Like I've positioned you here. And I think that there, there comes a moment where we have to like rise up and become the dream of God, like become the change, become the difference. And like in your story, you know, you're a 12 time all American swimmer, five titles, very accomplished, worked your whole life for this. And a moment of, of devastation and pain where you could have just wallowed in self pity and spent the rest of your life whining about how you got ripped off, you flipped the script and you rose up. And now like with your platform and your voice and your boldness is just encouraging millions around the world. Like, I think to me, that's such a beautiful storyline. And um, probably in that moment, you would have never imagined, you know, months and months down the road, you'd be where you are. 
no, this is never something I was actively seeking. This is never something I wanted. This is never something I even felt equipped for. Um, I've always had my beliefs and I've always stood firm in my beliefs, but I've never been someone who is, um, has this over political, over overly right. political background. I was never good at public speaking. Um, I still don't feel as if I'm equipped for doing what I'm doing, but I've realized when you're passionate about something, this passionate about something, yeah. all of those worries, all of those fears, especially that comes with speaking in front of people and speaking of something that's not um, popular. Obviously, I think the opinion that we share is popular in a sense of how the public feels about it, but it's right. not popular to, to voice that opinion. Right. But all of those worries, they go out of the window when you care about something this much. And right. that's something I've realized. It, I think it's almost in a sense <clears throat> liberating to speak your mind. It, it, the weight is off your shoulders when you're able right. to freely speak the truth. And yeah. so I wish more people were able to realize that. Um, I think courage begets courage, and I, I can only hope and pray that more and more people, especially women, of course this applies mm -hmm. to men too, but more and more women, more and more female athletes yeah. are willing to see the harm in what's mm -hmm. happening and are willing to use their platform, willing to use their voice to feel emboldened and feel empowered. And I can only hope that I'm setting some sort of an example for those women who, who witness this and know it's wrong. Yeah, I... Uh... I want to get into the weeds of some of this stuff and everything that you're involved with and the activism. And, but I was actually praying last night. I was, I was praying for you and I was praying about just this season we're in. I have, you know, a 12 year old daughter. Uh, she plays competitive soccer. Um, I have w one daughter and three boys and the, my, my girl is like the joy of my life, you know, and I, I, I get so riled up when I think about, you know, I, I think about the issues you faced, men exposing themselves to you, say they're women, like the 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 absolute insanity of the season that we're living in and that my 12 year old beautiful daughter is being exposed to. Um, and I was anyway, I was praying over you and maybe this is a word for you. I don't know. But I I had this sense, you know, when when everyone was coming to John the Baptist and they were like. Uh, in the New Testament, they were they were coming to him saying, who are you? What are you doing? What's your plan? Why are you doing all this? Are you doing this for popularity? Are you doing this for fame? Like, and I remember his response every time was, I am a voice. Like, I am a voice crying out in the wilderness, make way. You know, and I feel like the Lord's raising you up to be a voice that speaks the truth, that cuts through the crap, that cuts through the the, 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 the things that are really not that confusing. It's like people just need to break it down simply. And you're able to do that with your articulation and the history of what you've gone through. But like voices are what God needs right now. It's not brands. It's not platforms. It's not our names. It's not whatever. We need voices of clarity and God's really raised you up as one. And it's just, it, it's just really amazing. We're, we're all praying for you. We're so grateful for you. And, um, yeah, I just wanted to share that with you. I see you as a voice, a voice crying out in the wilderness, make way, make truth, make righteousness and justice. Like that is the plumb line. And so anyways, with all, all saying that, praying that more favor comes on your voice in this season. Now tell us what's going on, what the latest is. I saw you got attacked in San Francisco, been there, uh, unfortunately had that experience. <laughs> When you're attacked nice. by all the right people, it, it, it says something. <laughs> totally. It definitely does. Um, but just like yourself, this past year, really, especially these past few months, as the legislative cycle has kind of um, begun this, the, in the beginning of January, I've been traveling state to state, getting in front of yeah. state legislature, getting in front of anyone who will listen to me to express really my testimony share what happened, share how we felt. And when I say we, mm -hmm. I mean the overwhelming majority of female athletes at that meeting. Yes. I'm not speaking just, my spell, just myself. I'm speaking for so many more than mm -hmm. that. Um, hoping to enact change. Of course, at the federal level, I've been doing the same thing. Um, we have an administration in the White House right now who is actively working to rewrite Title IX. Right. Um, of course, Title IX is a federal civil rights law that is supposed to stop discrimination on the basis of sex among universities and campuses, which is a phenomenal thing. Um, of course, this would mean um, 
sororities are kept to just women. Women's bathrooms are kept to just women. Um, right. Women's, of course, academic scholarships, everything mm-hmm. that looks like. So we've seen the benefits of Title IX. That being said, they're working to rewrite it to where it's now no longer stopping discrimination on the basis of sex. It would be stopping discrimination on the basis of gender identity. So what this means is men could be in sororities. Men right. could live in dorms with women and women could do nothing about it or else they're guilty of sexual harassment. If you misgender <clears> someone <throat> under the rewrite of Title IX, then again, you're guilty of sexual harassment. Not the man who's parading around in your locker room with the opposite genitalia exposed. He's not guilty of anything. He's actually praised and celebrated and called brave and courageous. But if you were to express your discomfort, you're mm-hmm. the bigot. Um, and that's what they're pushing. And I yeah. think it's almost it's ironic because these are the people who once embraced the original feminist. Right. These are the people who fought for women's sex based <clears throat> protection. Now they're doing everything in their power to undermine that. Um, so that's what that kind of looks like at both the state and federal level. Um, something else I've been really involved in this past year is getting in front of college campuses, trying to engage right. people who are my age. Um, I'm 22. Actually, sorry, I just turned 23. I'm old now. Um, but I think <laughs> in engaging the college age range, that next generation, right. is so crucial. Um, they're not as apt to necessarily understand anything past TikTok, shall we say, um, right. or if the media they're consuming, it's not accurate. And so I feel as if it's kind of my duty to get in front of them. And sh- again, nothing opinionating, nothing hateful, just share mm-hmm. my experience and what we dealt yeah. with, what we faced and what we continue to face in regards to the silencing and the denying of objective truth. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's really important for them to understand that perspective. And while a lot of people don't come into it open-minded, I'm hopeful that at least some will um, and, and kind of be eye opened in the same way that I was. Well, you know, uh, you know, truth is hate speech to those who hate truth. So, you know, there's always going to be a manifestation against speaking truth. And whether that's, you know, babies in the womb or babies, you know, or human beings or whether that's men or men or women or women. I mean, we just we. But the interesting thing I think is, is we're seeing a full-blown manifestation that's widely known and seen, whether it's the crazy people that attacked you in San Francisco or whether it's the media or whether it's whoever, like it's coming to a head right now where it's just insane. And like your average normal person, if you track like (laughs) not even believers, but just like normal Americans, if you look at the polling, it's starting to swing super hard. Um, uh, and obviously politics is downstream culture. So culture sets the tone and then politics follows. And so the fact you're going to these college campuses, the fact that you're raising your voice, that's at the same time, that's what changes the political paradigm. Um, I, I love that you're doing that. We're doing that in every capital and every city we go to, we're speaking out the truth and, and that we're fearfully and wonderfully made And this whole spirit of confusion that has a generation of bondage. Um, is, is, is insane. Now at the same time, I love, one of the things I love about your doing is, is you're calling out these prominent female athletes. Um, you know, you see Megan Rapino or, or, or whoever these Brittany Griner, or whoever these, these women are that are supposed to be the feminists that want equal pay and equal on all this kind of stuff. And it's kind of hilarious, you know, then Megan Rapino goes out there, plays a group of 15 year old boys and gets smoked in soccer. I mean, destroyed. The whole team gets destroyed. And it's kind of like, at some point, there has to be a little bit of mockery in this thing where it's like, this isn't really what you want. What do you, no, what, what, what do you think about all that? I think if you've ever seen Megan Rapino play, um, if yeah. you've ever watched her, she's a very tough player. She's very mm-hmm. aggressive. I think if a male tried to take Megan Rapinoe's spot on a soccer team, spot on the U.S. women's national team. Right. Give them. I think that it would be like, I think that she would not respond kindly to that. Yet I think it's worth mentioning that she's done playing. She's at the end of her career, and she doesn't have a daughter right. to defend. Therefore, why not be virtuous? Why not um, right. Right. be as inclusive and kind and loving and accepting and tolerant and all of those things, when in reality... 
it's not kind to ask a girl to undress in front of a man without, of course, yeah. getting the girl's consent. And it's not inclusive to ask a girl to smile and step aside and allow these men onto our podiums, taking away our trophies, our scholarships, our titles, our opportunities. That's not inclusive. That's exclusive to the very female athletes who Title IX was passed to protect, who Megan Rapino once fought to um, ensure equal right. pay and equal access and all of those things. You're right, it is almost comical because the double standard is so evident to anyone with even a lick of sense, um, a lick right. of, I mean, understanding. You would be able to perfectly see the irony behind this, and we're seeing it with Billy Griner. I mean, sorry, Brittany Griner and Billie Jean King. Um, Billie Jean mm-hmm. King is someone who once fought relentlessly for, I mean, she was a crusader for women's sports. She's essentially who we have to accredit Title IX to. And now we have Billie Jean King coming out and fighting for male inclusion in women's sports and women's spaces. It doesn't make sense. And it's back to that original feminist movement that we were talking about um, a few moments ago. The irony. I I think that's what this really boils down to. Um, And again, it's worth mentioning that they're not playing. They've had their success. They've they've eaten the cake. So... (laughs) Yeah. So do you like, as you're starting to do this and call out these female athletes, um, which I love, by the way, are, what, are you getting any kind of response? Are there any allies jumping on board? Is anyone getting in the fight with you? Absolutely. There are, um, just actually a few days ago, I sent a letter to Congress where I had 72 athletes sign on. And of these 72 athletes, there was about 40 or so Olympians. Um, there was world record holders on this list. There was all Americans, NCAA athletes, the most yeah, impressive awesome. athletes that this world, this country especially has ever seen. And wow. they were able to sign on. We were able to send it directly to Congress. And so I do feel as if this is gaining traction. I feel like people, the tides are really starting to turn. Um, I think people have realized that kind of not taking a stance on this is taking a stance. Right. Because if you're silent, if you're silent, you're complicit. And that's no longer an option. Um, I understand there are sacrifices that will be made in terms of, especially with elite athletes having to fear losing sponsors or putting them in a self themselves in a position where they'll be criticized, but it's not bad for your brand to defend women. It's just not, it's to take that approach means you don't care about women. And that is your answer. Well, it's always the right time to do the right thing. I mean, it's, this is just the, and and so I mean you're right on that. I uh, I was I was curious about um, I follow her the uh, that that Olympian. Her name's Sid- Sydney. Um, have you reached out to her? Uh, do you know who I'm talking about McCla- McClellan? She is a phenomenal person. Um, she went yeah. to the University of Kentucky as well, and I remember when I went on my recruiting trip to University of Kentucky. Um, she was of course still living in the dorms and I, I saw her and I knew who she was prior to taking my trip there. And I was starstruck by her. She's a mm-hmm. Christian. She publicly often posts about her faith and her journey right. and, and what right. it's like for her. And she's someone who I just think is really real. Um, I don't believe she's taken a stance on this, but I, I think it's worth pressuring her to yeah. do so because she's yeah. one who's influential. She's a world Very. record holder. She's phenomenal. Um, and she's young. She's, I think my age, maybe a year older. And so she, I I think that she would be worth pressuring for sure. So, so tell me this, what, okay. Believer strong, outspoken about a faith. What, what is it that has to be inside of somebody to take the next step in your faith, call out right from wrong and be willing to, to handle the smoke? Like what, what is it that you think in terms? is that process that that pushes people back from being willing to say what we all know is true. I think what it was for me, um, I get called brave all the time. I get called courageous all the time. And while I do agree that it takes a level of courage to be able to do this, I didn't feel courageous. I I don't feel brave. I don't feel as if I'm doing something that's um, when I think of someone who's brave, I, have, I think of our law enforcement or I think of who's in the military who are risking their lives. Right. Um, so I don't feel brave by any means, but kind of what hit me 
really within these last two or three weeks, I've come to this realization that when people are calling me brave, we're really just scared of different things. Um, they're scared of being labeled as something, or they're scared of this cancel culture that we live in. Right. Um, but those things don't scare me. That's not what terrifies me. What terrifies right. me is not standing for the truth. Um, because again, that's when you know we've reached a point in society where there's a major problem. Um, you can open any history book and see how what we're kind of going through in terms of, again, the denying of objective truth, the changing of the language that we use, the silencing aspect, mm-hmm. um, how they want to take our guns. There's a lot of different pieces to this. It's deeply rooted in Marxism. Right. And I think I'm able to see that and see how we're actively leading ourselves in that direction. By the fate of yeah. our, our own hands, we are exponentially declining. Um, and I, I think that's what scares me. Being silent, knowing this yeah. is happening, that's scarier to me than being labeled transphobic, homophobic. I get called racist, even though this has right. nothing to do with Right. They'll throw any label your way. And I think... I came to the realization that that speaks more about their own insecurities yeah. than it does about me. Yeah, I mean the labels. <clears throat> I mean they, they they constantly are coming up with new labels and new ways to try to try to destroy people's lives. However, it's actually had the opposite effect. I know. I know. With me, it's like you know we get death threats and 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 stuff say, sent to us by Satanists all the time and persecuted, but. It actually only grows the movement. It's it's funny how God uses that controversy to actually build up your platform. However, I, I think it's interesting on a theological level. Like if we just step there for a minute, like like who are you? What do you believe? Do you live according to your convictions? And it seems like in 2023, if you're not catching some kind of pushback, like if you're not going against the grain of culture. If you're not getting canceled, if you're not getting censored, if you don't have any kind of resistance, it's like, what are you really standing for? I mean, what is your message to believers along those lines? My message to believers is to be unwavering, just as our our God was. Um, we That's how we've gotten here is because we've wavered from what is right and what right. is true in a biblical sense. Um, that's why we're here. And we need to say enough is enough, and we have to stand firm for our convictions. That's something throughout this whole process, especially towards the beginning of this, I did kind of struggle. Um, The hardest comment for me to receive, because I'm, of course, a public Christian as well. I'm someone who talks about my faith. Um, But the hardest comment for me to receive was people who would comment on my Instagram or whatever and say, you know, you call yourself a Christian, but our God wouldn't do this. You know, you're hateful. And when I read this at first, it was hard. I'm like, okay, am I doing the right thing? Because I, of course, know we have a God of love. I know our God loves yeah. everyone, regardless of who you are. Right. Uh, I knew that, but it took me a while to kind of realize, or I guess really understand that, of course, our God loves, but we have a God who hates sin. Um, yeah. Our God created man and woman, and our God doesn't make mistakes. Right. Yeah. That being said, our God also says, um, I, I, in Luke and a couple other books, that it's not the it's not the healthy who need the doctor; it's the sick. We yeah. have to be the people who are willing to spread the message to yeah. the sick. Um, not to put it just in terms of an analogy, that's what we have to do. That's why we're here on this planet is to spread His message. And we need people to be reminded of that. That's that's our whole purpose on this world, which is a, a blink of an eye in terms of the time we spend here yeah. compared to eternity. We have to be willing to communicate his message. Amen. And God is love, meaning that if he is love, he's the one that defines love. It's not this love is love is love is love. No, no. What are the definitions of God's love? Because they're radically different than the definitions the world tries to place, you know, and we obviously know that, but it's, it's, you know, we see a loving God, you know, draw the line, you know, we see a loving God protect kids. We see a loving God, you know, uh, that, that created men and women uniquely different. And right now we're seeing a demonic agenda to conflate and pervert what God has called good. And so, you know, it is love to rise up and want to protect that. That is the love of God. Um, 
I want to ask you one, maybe one last question, two last questions. Um, first of all, okay. So you're 23. Um, you're married. Uh, you're a hunter, which by the way, I love, like, I just, it's amazing. You're like already, you're already another level to me of like a, a legend. The fact that you're a bow hunter and you're really good at it, but fast <laughs> forward, um, let's fast forward 15 years. Okay. 20 years of your life. So you have a daughter, maybe you'll have more than one, but you have at least one daughter and she's got your genetics and DNA, which means she's probably going to crush it at whatever she sport she chooses to do. What is your dream for her? Like walk me through a little bit of the future. Like what, what is your dream moving forward? I think more than anything, something that I am so fortunate for myself, for my parents um, mm. as you mentioned, I do come from a very genetically blessed family in terms of athletics. <laughs> my dad, he played in the NFL. My mom, she was a D1 wow. softball player. All of my uncles played professional sports. So I, I do come from a family who understands sports. That being said, um, more than anything, more than anything I value about my family, my foundation, how I was raised is I'll say forced, but I don't actually mean forced, but we were forced to go to church growing up. We were forced yeah. to every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Um, we grew up church of Christ and that's a bit of a drab when you're 12 years old and you're the youngest one by like 60 years. Um, <laughs> but value in kind of that discipline and in learning about faith, learning about again, why we're here on this planet. And so I think that family foundation is huge. And so more than anything, I want to create that for my family. Um, this whole, the reason why I'm fighting this, this whole movement is it's not mm -hmm. for me. Um, I'm done playing sports. I could care less. Yeah. I mean, you'd have to pay me to get back in the pool. Actually, you probably couldn't even pay yeah. me because I would probably see. Um, so it's not about me. It's about my yeah. daughter. It's about my little right. sister who's Tennessee's state yeah. champion in gymnastics. It's fighting for that next generation. And if there's one thing right. I could instill in my future children is to be unwavering, to stand firm, to not back down. Being mm -hmm. a leader is something that is so, so admirable. And that's something I always um, would hope for, for my children. It's powerful. Well, you're setting an, an amazing example. And I think, you know, just like I dream of a day where abortion is unheard of in the next generation, you know, I'm, we're also dreaming of a day where, you know, women's sports are protected and where locker rooms are protected and where our kids are not, we're not sending our kids into a dungeon of perversion and confusion. And so we're taking, we're taking ground. Things are changing. And I want to encourage you on that. Lastly, uh, be before we end this, what, what are some ways, give people some takeaways. Obviously they're, they're listening to hearing your heart. Um, they may not fully understand Title IX or the or the you know the things that we were talking about or the different bills. But what are some practical steps that we can tell people that are listening? Hey, listen, do this. Rise up with us. Do you, maybe you can't do all this. Maybe you can't go to all these universities or 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 give yourself to act, activism like you are. I mean, God has you in that place. But what can your average everyday person do to start moving momentum forward? I think first and foremost, and I kind of hate saying this because it makes me sound like an activist, but staying informed, it really is important. Um, I think right. staying up to date on these issues that are happening. My, my situation where we competed against Leah Thomas and changed in a locker room, I mean, that is so far from unique. That is happening all ages, all levels, mm -hmm. all divisions, all sports across the country. Right. Um, really, I'm list off probably a hundred examples off the top of my head. It really is. And so I always try and post about these kinds of things on my Twitter page, which is Riley underscore Gaines underscore, um, because I, I think it's really important for the general public to see who might not see these right. things. And they don't fall yeah. into believing the narrative that the left likes to push that this is a non-issue and it's not really happening because that's not true. Two, especially for parents, um, I think it's crucial to be willing to defend your daughters and to teach your sons masculinity, first yeah. of all, because... I feel as if we've gotten so far from um, so far from that. I feel like masculinity now is deemed as something that's. I mean, we bad. hear the term toxic masculinity. We, yeah, right. it's just deemed as something that's bad. But 
that's not true. Um, any woman wants a manly man, I promise you. And if they don't, um, that's, that's not, that's not the general consensus among women. Yeah. Um, teaching your sons that teaching or being able to defend your daughters, go to school board meetings. Um, don't be afraid to ruffle feathers and step on toes because that's what we need. We need, we need that. That's how change will be made ultimately. So yeah. I think just being emboldened enough to have conversations, be willing to talk about this and don't shy away from how you feel all while, all while remaining, of course, compassionate to a degree. Um, I think handling this issue with a level of respect and a level of compassion is important. But that being said, denying objective truth is denying God's reality. So don't, ever of course i think above anything is to stand firm in the truth yeah that's so good and you know parents are a powerful force we saw it in virginia you know they flay they they flip the whole state and that's actually going to be our next capital where we're at with governor yunkin and they're working right now on some of these same bills so anyway as we go state to state you know you have our commitment we've been to 12 capitals so far and just like in kansas we were helping push that in oklahoma we want to go state to state and really back you and do what we can. So we're going to, we're going to continue to advocate. Um, we're going to continue to rise up and follow your lead. So everybody go follow her on Twitter. Um, we'll post all the links, share this, be encouraged. Thank you again so much for taking time to come on. It's such a encouragement. And uh, well, thank you. really, I appreciate all the work you do really. So do I. I, 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 and I appreciate the fact that, you know, those, those big bucks are getting into velvet right now. And, uh, so hopefully oh, mamas are pregnant. It's, it's a good time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much for coming on. God bless you, Riley. What an honor. We're praying for you. We're cheering you on. Well, thank you.